And and uh, so thank, welcome everybody to the second talk of this spring semester series. Uh, today we have Professor Lilin Fan from the University of South Florida, who will be uh, talking to us about a topic that is very interesting to a chapter because it's precisely this interface between power and power electronics. Uh, so Professor Fan has um, a lot of papers and publications and experience in the analysis of disturbances and real world events using techniques that we're gonna discuss during this uh, talk. And Professor Fang, just take it away. Yeah, thank you, Jose, for the invitation. Uh, my pleasure to deliver a talk at the UC Berkeley. So can you all hear me well? Yes. Excellent. So, uh, so I put a subtitle here um, as the beauty of Lapsas transform, but the main title, of course, is the analysis of IBR dynamic events. Uh, because you can see that uh, probably we'll talk about frequency domain analysis, which is something that I uh, was doing recently. So I like to share everybody just my research journey. I started my PhD working on the facts power system analyzer, uh, stabilizer using model control state space modeling. Uh, at this point, like 2007, after working in six years in industry, switched to academia in North Dakota State. I start to work on wind turbine, a wind farm modeling and control. So there I pick up this AC machine and the power electronics. So moving on in the next couple of years in USF, pick up this uh, optimization, uh, convex optimization, MIP, pretty mathematic. And then back in like a couple of years ago, uh, IBR becomes very hard to work on the solar PV and IBR uh, dynamic again, which uh, in this case, I. I now start with uh, a frequency domain analysis a lot. And thanks a lot to the CETO gave me a big grant uh, in 2019 to work on uh, solar PV modeling. Uh, so most recently, NSF got uh, awarded me a grant uh, to work on the system identification, uh, which is the combination of uh, dynamics and optimization to do IBR modeling uh, using data. So that's uh, also a nice, uh, a nice one, I should say. So today I want to share with everybody the IBR dynamic events we see in real world and lots of the uh, conventional analysis methods like EMT, like eigenvalue uh, dynamic model building. Uh, but then my focus probably will after half of the talk, I want to talk, uh, show this uh, uh, nice thing called Laplace. Like, uh, very fundamental, but I found it's very interesting. So the particular example I want to show uh, share with everybody is this the type three wind farm SSR subsynchronous resonance. And we can see that we can build a simple circuit to do uh, this type of analysis. And then I show a couple other events. Um, furthermore, one, another thing is the matrix decomposition. Once we can do everything in frequency domain, we just found that all these multiple generator interior oscillation can be explained uh, nicely using simple circuit. So these are the uh, main outline so I will get started just to show a couple of uh, task force reports we did just in average simple one. Uh, this is a wind SSO task force that was uh, set up in 2017 with a couple of uh, Texas colleagues. And we just focus on the wind farm events, uh, oscillation events, so SSO in Texas, Minnesota, and North China, West China, and UK. So these are all uh, type uh, three type of four wind farm oscillations. So mainly we cover six events. The first category is this series capacitor SSO uh, with the type three wind generator and the series capacitor. The second category is the wind, uh, uh, sorry, weak grid SSO. Uh, just no capacitor, but uh, the system is pretty weak. So moving on, then we found that uh, in fact, solar PV also has a lot of weak grid SSO. So then we did the um, change the name of the task force and to be IBR SSO. And this is the recent paper, we, it's still under review, like R2 now. Uh, 19 events is collected. You can see that we put uh, new events there, 22 hertz in Dominion energy. This is a sort of like a power quality issue, but then there's another one, hydro one, 20 hertz, 80 hertz oscillations. You can see uh, yeah, ABC, 80 hertz and uh, DQ or IMS value, 20 hertz. Uh, Australia has, uh, but so we events as well. So undergoing a lot of uh, research, uh, I put this page as just uh, the past research papers in case people are interested. 
Uh, North America solar PV has lots of solar PV disturbances recently. I think uh, in the couple of uh, last five years also, and the NERC has a working group just to write down, uh, write these, uh, uh, these reports and uh, you can find it online. And for some of the events, these are dynamic events. So for example, first one is like protection events because the frequency measurement error, but the subcycle voltage instantaneous over current. These are dynamic events. You can use dynamic analysis to uh, tackle these, uh, understand the root cause. So these are the two papers that published uh, for these two events supported by DOEC2. Um, so to, uh, the next couple of slides, I will focus more on the SSO, series capacitor SSO, the interaction of the series capacitor and the type of four wind. So uh, as a startup, I just uh, show that uh, uh, capacitor has been used in the grid a lot. So this one is from Jonathan Rose of Alcott. And he's showing that alcohol the map, and you can see lots of capacitor has been used 50%. And essentially, this is used to shorten the electric distance, make the impedance smaller. So we can ship more power. That's a cheap transmission. However, series capacitor can also introduce resonances, ILC resonance. And uh, uh, I think uh, this is very fundamental from Professor Lu Wins YouTube video. Um, ILC circuit, uh, ILC circuit series, uh, connected, then we expect to see the uh, oscillations. And if we view this entire thing using an impedance, then it, it, it will show a dip uh, somewhere called resonance frequency. So that means the wrist is very small. Uh, this guy cancel the other guy, the inductor cancel the capacitor. Um, so we should expect to see overcurrent. And this resonance is uh, less than 60 hertz. Why? Because there's the equation that you can use it's just the square root of the compensation level multiplied by the 60 hertz. So compensation level is usually less than 100%, 50% for the most. So that's why it's always less than 60 hertz in the ABC frame, I should say static frame. Uh, now, um, in the history, SSI has happened in with uh, electrical series capacitor with the synchronous generator connection. So this is the 1970 uh, Mohab power plant in Nevada. And there's torsional damage. That reason is because a uh, synchronous generator radially connected with the series capacitor ISC circuit and electrical resonance happened to uh, compensate with this uh, a torsional interaction, torsional mode. They add together um, almost get, get to 60 hertz then torsional interaction occur. So in these 1970s, 1980s, lots of study has been done. And one of them I should mention is uh, John Andrew, who's still actively working in WAC modeling group. And he started to use this admittance based screening. So he put a generator here and IC circuit here, both of them as impedance circuit. But then you can construct a feedback loop, admittance and the impedance of generator. So it's a sort of like a ratio between these two impedances. You can uh, use it as a loop again. And once you have the loop again, of course, you can do all these kind of uh, MI by O uh, stability analysis using generalized diacoustic criteria. Uh, another thing he mentioned is that he can do frequency scan using data. In fact, you don't need to derive model, rather you use data to sinusoidal perturbation, grab this frequency response. So that's something from his, uh, uh, this 1976 paper that I found is pretty sophisticated. So having said this, this is a well-known event, I think, um, Power system guys has solved this issue. They put a lot of protection device. They know how to deal with that. So SSR seems like a no big deal. Um, but uh, once the type of four generator, wind, wind farm generator start to put into grid, now we see something very similar. So this first one is 2007. Uh, Minnesota has seen like a 9.4 uh, SSO. Uh, so there's a wind farm connected to the grid, 100 megawatt. And uh, in the neighborhood, it also has another synchronous generator, also 100 megawatt. So now the breaker five and six, they have something that tripped to leaving the wind plant and uh, radially connect to the series of capacitor. So this is, this is the connection sort of like, and then the system will see nine hertz oscillation. This is over current and had some damage caused to the wind plant, I, I suppose. So initially people think, okay, maybe this is, uh, uh, torsional, you know, like the same thing, like the synchronous generator issue, but they found actually there's no issue here. It's the issue of wind, wind plant. 
So 2007, then following up just uh, after 2007 in 2009 in Texas, this one is more severe, caused more damage. So this one was uh, uh, brought to attention more. The same thing in South Texas, uh, wind farm, and there's a generator, there's a transmission line tripped. So leaving the type of three wind farm connect to the radio transmission line and overcurrent, huge overcurrent and very high current uh, got there. Uh, so this is uh, Texas. So I think the following year, people just solved this issue because uh, I think GE, they said uh, they put some damping control and fixed it. So then it didn't happen in the next 80 years until 2017. Uh, there are three events that happened uh, in the just 2017. So that's why we formed this uh, wind SSO test force. And the very, the, the penetration is pretty high. You know, the reason there's lots of wind plant put in. And one challenge is that uh, well, uh, one wind uh, OEM, they cannot even replicate this study. They, they spend almost a year just to replicate, replicate this kind of event. So once they be able to replicate this kind of event, then they can fix it by control solutions. So these are the uh, field data reported. Uh, this is voltage, this is current, and this is uh, FFT. So you can see the current high um, overcurrent is there, and you can see that's about 26 hertz. That's fundamental signal hertz because of the radio connection once you trip a line. Uh, another event is also have 22 hertz uh, along with signal hertz. So these are the uh, Texas event. Um, North China, of course, also have this kind of event. They similarly just uh, many wind turbine radially connect to the 500 kV line. They see like uh, 80 hertz. Uh, I keep having this 85 SSRCI uh, event, and they put uh, uh, develop some devices and to counter those kind of uh, oscillations. Uh, so the next slide, I'm going to just talk about how we replicate or analyze this one. So type of three wind farm SSR basically has two elements. One is it has to be type of three, then another is a serious capacitor radio connection. Uh, resulting point is that then system will have this kind that kind of uh, different frequencies. So we have a couple of questions posed. What is the root cause? Is this cause similar as the previous synchronous generator uh, torsional interaction, or it is different? And another thing is the high wind speed, good or bad? Uh, high compensation level, good or bad. So all this is sort of like uh, you can do it in routine way. Uh, the routine way is basically EMT simulation and DQ frame analog model building. EMT simulation, for example, PSCAD and MATLAB simscape, it's like GUI based. And uh, we can construct a model, put uh, uh, generators there, construct, a, now this is a construction of the 2070 Texas three events. We, can, we did this one. Uh, but this is uh, now more or less like experiments. You keep doing experiments. And if you don't have the sense regarding the mechanism, you probably cannot replicate these events. So uh, a better way is that in fact, you should, should first do the analytical modeling and uh, do eigenvalues to have some sense. So this can be done in the DQ frame, uh, build a model in DQ frame and do linearization model analysis. And eigenvalue can give us more insights. Uh, for this type of thing, usually we build a very simple model, single wind farm using single wind turbine and an IRC circuit. Um, I put two papers in 2009 and 2010 here. Uh, the first one is from Canadian professors Yazdani and uh, Vama. Yazdani has a book in power electronics right, and the power system, VSC. So he did a very nice linear model and can exactly match the EMT. Um, and so then the following up, I think in 2010, we did a paper, but we explicitly related this to address the question, engineering question, is this a uh, torsion oscillation? Uh, how can, why? So this kind of circuit analysis. So that's the two papers in 2010. So the main engineering insights just from this kind of analysis, I will put down this slide showing here. So simple model, 20th order state space model. And so to be frank, at that time, I didn't know like how to build a PLL. So PLL was not included, uh, but I think the Azani paper has PLL included. So even so, we can do eigenvalue analysis. And this one is uh, pretty critical to show that as a mode, uh, moving to the right if the compensation level increases. Uh, furthermore, we put a different wind speed and you can see that uh, lower wind speed is worse. 
so there are a couple of uh, discovery. Number one, this is electrical resonance, not torsional interaction, because we also modeled the torsional thing and we found torsional mode is very, very small. You cannot compensate or you know, add together to be signals. Secondly, low, low wind speed is bad, uh, bad and high compensation is bad. So the question is why low wind speed is bad? Low wind speed means low rotating speed. So we can use a circuit. This is the steady state circuit of induction machine. And I think people know that uh, from heart, uh, like a slip uh, resistor divided by slip that's equivalent resistor. Um, so usually I think in the conventional way, people will say, let's put some synchronous frequency instead of signals, put some synchronous frequency and see what happens. So they will say, uh, this guy becomes negative. And if we have lower wind speed, this is more negative. The, the resistor is equivalent resistor is more negative. So that explains why the lower wind speed and causes more negative resistor and make the entire system uh, uh, more sort of like unstable. So I move forward. So this kind of main, main finding has been validated by a field data collected by Professor Xie of Tsinghua University in his uh, 2017 paper. He did like 58 events. You know, so I will not repeat that. It just says not torsional dynamics, wind speed is, is bad, uh, or lower is bad. Um, so we conducted more eigenvalue analysis and the feedback control in the following year. And then there's something more uh, interesting that uh, sort of like puzzling. Number one, if in DQ frame, uh, you will see that the 60 hertz and the 106 hertz. One is called subsynchronous, one is called supersynchronous. Yeah, both of them are caused by the ABC frame 44 hertz. One is 60 minus 44, the other is 60 plus 44. And uh, if we change the rotor resistance and the one becomes unstable, we can better. And so that's uh, something that is pretty, pretty puzzling. The second thing is that if we want to design control, damping control, you will use line current and feed in like the um, IMS value, feed in and uh, modulate the GSC's uh, voltage control uh, command. And then the subsynchronous mode becomes uh, ba uh, better, supersynchronous becomes worse. So this, this is a really uh, posed uh, this kind of challenge and say, why, why is that? You know, this is uh, again, experiment level two, but if we try to answer why, then we need something more. So that, um, prompts us to keep thinking. So that's the theoretical way to really explain this negative uh, root resistance. Or in another way, this is called self-excitation because the induction generator in fact, IGE. Conventional way, classical explanation of IGE is they use this steady state circuit we just mentioned. And the slip can be written as one minus the root speed divided by the stator uh, frequency. And if we plug in state of frequency by different frequency, like the resonance frequency, and this slip become negative. And that's documented in the Kundo's book, steady state. Um, so I was thinking that, yeah, steady state circuit, can we just get a dynamic circuit? So check the textbook or Crow's book. Dynamic circuit is, I, I should say, is not that straightforward. Yeah, so if you look at this dynamic circuit in building DQ frame, there are fluxes. Coupling then root side fluxes and state side. So if we use this model, it's really quite difficult to understand. It's not like this one. So that's a good, keep it moving. So if we look at the steady state circuit, you can we really like uh, extend it to be dynamic circuit. So one argument is that the steady state circuit, if we look at really phase impedance model at the 60 hertz, it is just a particular case of S equal J omega, where omega is like 377 radius per second. So therefore we can do reverse engineering, like, uh, like change this J omega by S, then we got the S domain model. And S domain model is basically dynamic model. So inductor capacitor straightforward. Now there's a slip. And the slip looks like this is dynamic because if you change the uh, perturbation frequency in state side, this is, is done, but it looks written like this way. It cannot, where do you put S? There's no J. So what's happening is that you can add this J upstairs, downstairs, and replace the downside becomes S. Then we get the transfer function. Uh, that's a straightforward, uh, uh, some kind of derivation. 
And if we can use this to do more analysis and matches, then we can say, yeah, although it's sort of like uh, derived from just a uh, gut feeling, but it may be correct. So we did this kind of analysis called a stability, frequency domain stability as using um, these kind of uh, as domain based uh, circuit. Now everything is as as is dynamic circuit. And we can use this impedance versus that impedance, uh, sort of like what uh, John Andrew did, construct uh, this kind of feedback loop system using loop gain or using this bully diagram, one impedance match the other one. Yeah, what do we found? Yeah, it's uh, same conclusion can be obtained. Lower wind speed bad and higher compensation level unstable. So, so that means looks like this kind of derivation from gutter feeding looks like a correct. And uh, so we move forward. I see my collaborator, Dr. Zi Jingliao, who did the derivation again. So he, this time he started from Krause's DQ frame model and do it one by one, written like maybe eight to nine pages to exactly got this. Um, and the same thing. So the application, second application is the first application is stability. Second application, we can even use this kind of circuit to explain sub and super synchronous mode why they are not the same. So for example, once we put this everything in the frequency domain and we can grab the total admittance and total admittance is zero that becomes systems eigenvalue. Uh, and there's one eigenvalue at plus 42 Hertz. Another is minus 42 Hertz. If we increase the series compensation level, one becomes unstable, the other looks like a, they don't move. So put this total impedance, total Z uh, uh, type of uh, wind blast uh, line. This is the blue line you know, that I put, and I put the red line just to you know, it's a little bit confusing, but the, the blue line should be the focus. You can see that two dips. These two dips is at, uh, one is at minus 40, the other at, at, uh, at the 42 Hertz. So the minus 40 actually shows, this is the resistor, but the plus 40, of course, this is uh, negative resistor. So that explains why one becomes unstable, the other becomes stable at 65%. Uh, uh, if we view everything in the DQ frame, just move the uh, reference frame from zero to 60 Hertz, then we should see that uh, the, this one is minus 18, the other one is minus 102. So one is the sub, the other is super. Uh, and you can see these two are basically unsymmetric and they will be, for example, wind speed and compensation uh, the subsynchronous is sensitive, but the supersynchronous is uh, insensitive. And this kind of asymmetry is you know, introduced by the uh, rotor um, reference frame that the slip is quite an interesting expression. There's S minus J omega that's complex. Um, so with this said, I will uh, move forward just looking at the, uh, check the uh, literature, see if uh, this kind of thing has been discovered previously. So after a couple of years, when once I re-pick up this IVR dynamic model only recently, now that I find that in fact Professor Adam Semlin from University of Toronto wrote something in 1999 paper. Although he's just doing everything like just just half a page or maybe a quarter page just to just describe this induction motor uh, what's the behavior. So this paper has doesn't have many citations, but probably 30, but really, really insightful. In fact, I pick up a quite a nice math from this S domain methodology for eigenvalue analysis, because that's this from Professor Samblin's breaking work. And uh, if you look at the most, most of the time in power electronic world, they don't do this. Once they have this one, they always do this, like right? body plot and Nyquist. And myself, I'm not good at uh, looking at this in circlement. It's quite confusing. I like uh, uh, eigenvalues. Uh, so, so this part is uh, really something that the S domain circuit can help us to explain things super, super neat. So I put two more uh, oscillation events just to show that we can use simple circuit to explain things. Uh, this one is coming from Professor Shane to a very recent paper. He showed this five hertz oscillation is due to a uh, type three wind farm and there's the HVDC system in China, North China, and they found their system had five hertz oscillation in a static frame. Uh, this is a five hertz on top of 60 hertz. And FFT analysis showed that five hertz, and, uh, 
this is the their system, sorry, is 50 hertz, but the five hertz is dominant, you can see. Uh, so the explanation over the here is a type three wind at the five hertz of course is negative risk uh, and the uh, inductor. And then they also did a measurement. They really found that uh, MMC, uh, HVDC can serve as a capacitor at five hertz. So this can quickly explain that why they, they we can shoot this kind of overcurrent and just doing the subsystem measurement they can see. So another event, yeah, if you have questions, yeah, please interrupt me. Yeah, another event I want to show just using simple circuit analysis, the 80 Hertz um, oscillation showing in solar PV farm in 2015, Hydro One. Uh, that is a sink of 30 megawatt high solar PV distribution system. And the system, of course, these are the field data. ABC frame current showing 80 Hertz oscillation and the uh, IMS value voltage showing 20 Hertz. And this is FFT again showing 80 Hertz and the nominal uh, is 60 Hertz. So if we take a look at just looking at this, this again looks to us, maybe look like ILC circuit, maybe um, something is at 80 Hertz is happening. It's like, like uh, overcurrent because it's overcurrent. So the uh, congestion is just the uh, VSC, probably they behave like a negative resistor and a capacitor. So then the entire system is uh, IL circuit, then the left side will be the capacitor and the resistor. So if we can do this, we can tune the controller because we really don't know what's inside. So I'm just uh, trying to replicate this kind of event just by tuning this controller to make sure there will be 80 Hertz dip. Uh, whether with or without the shunt, uh, the things are pretty similar because the grid data we know because previously Hydro One was uh, suspecting this guy, shunt capacitor plays a role. But in fact, the analysis just showing shunt capacitor has nothing to do with 80 Hertz uh, oscillation mode. So once we tune this, this data, then you can put into the EMG simulation test band and really replicate this uh, very similar um current this is 80 hertz then this is ms voltage is 20 hertz so that's another one just using simple circuit to do things uh yeah so i have uh, yeah this is isc circuit part i have uh, talked about everything related to the isc circuit i think i will move forward to talk about another example how to use laplace transform using stephen brunton's word i watched his youtube and uh, Called the control maybe boot camp. Uh, what he said is that Laplace transformation makes calculus easy to be handled by high schooler. Uh, I found another benefit is that uh, each time as a control guy, if you build a block diagram, very sophisticated one, you do Laplace transform, then you can build this block diagram algebra. It's algebra. And furthermore, you can apply linear algebra like matrix eigenvalue decomposition, and then you can bring new insights. So the next two applications is just using matrix decomposition can show us something that we haven't seen before. One is the inter error oscillation. The other is the inter-inter uh, IBR mode uh, discovered. Uh, regarding matrix decomposition, actually, if we look at historical node that has been used in power grid, for example, uh, this is Clark, that is Clark's transform, a three-phase system like mesh network becomes decomposed network. And the symmetrical component, similarly, you apply symmetric component theory, you, you've got the de decomposed circuit. So underlying theory is a big matrix, uh, eigenvalue decomposition got the uh, decoupled things. Decoupled elements, then you do voltage current uh, in different coordinates, for example, ABC to sequence domain, decoupled circuit. So this kind of philosophy you can put a move on, maybe you're looking at the inter oscillation. Here's this inter oscillation in real world in east uh, connection, one group uh, against another group, 0.25 hertz. In WAC system, they are also like 0.25 hertz. Usually it's very low frequency and like this. So we move on just to looking at the classic uh, two area four machine system and see how we can really explain this inter oscillation one group versus another and the uh, mode is so low compared to the single generator to infinity bus. So for each generator, we can build this uh, transfer function uh, as domain. Um, uh, this is the uh, power can influence the uh, root angle. That's a very simple swing dynamic equation, second order. And each of four generators, we can treat it the same. 
Uh, now the electric circuit will couple the uh, rotor angle and uh, influence the uh, power. So that's a feedback system. We just put the loop again here. And uh, in between, this is the Laplacian matrix. I put it as L, but uh, it's very similar like a minus B if we use DC power flow assumption. Uh, so eigenvalue decomposition of L will give us uh, eigenvalues and that's decoupled. And then coordinate the conversion, then we got the full decoupled circuit like this. It's a full decoupled uh, uh, system, I should say. And each one of them is just a single generator connect to a impedance. And uh, with lambda two, which is the smallest uh, eigenvalue of Laplacian matrix, actually corresponding to the largest uh, model impedance. So interior oscillation can be just explained like this. It's a, it's a single generator interact with the largest uh, model impedance. And that's why it generated the uh, very low oscillation frequency. Uh, that's the work uh, I did in like 2017. Um, I should uh, also say that uh, after reading Richard Morris paper probably in 2015 on something called consensus control. That's why we use Laplacian matrix. And he is he, showing similar like a decoupling thing, although it's not like circuit related, it's a, it's a consensus control. Uh, I go to the second application is that uh, inter IBR oscillation can also be identified using the similar way. So when the system has uh, two IBRs, you should expect you should expect to see like uh, multiple modes. Uh, if we have just the one single IBR to the grid, the grid become weak. There's a weaker grid oscillation. You can tune the model, make a weaker grid oscillation happen. Um, and that's real world. Of course, we also see these Texas four hertz oscillations. A lot of them are, are weak grid oscillations. Um, now you put another one, then there will be another mode. So eigenvalue analysis will show there's another mode. And you make the grid weak, increase the impedance. One mode will move to the right. The other mode will not move. It's just uh, keep it there. Uh, dynamic simulation can also show that P1 against P2, that you can see these two oscillation, two IBRs seem like oscillate against each other. So mode shape, of course, you can, you can see this mode shape. One mode is like a two IBR against each other. The other mode, two IBRs working together uh, like a zero sequence, you can call it aggregating mode. Yeah, so this is like a conventional method to give you lots of uh, idea, or already give you lots of idea. Uh, but uh, can we explain why the inter-IBR mode is not influenced by the grid uh, strength? So can we construct a simple circuit to explain this? Yeah, otherwise it's still like experiment. Right? It's, this is still numerical experiment. So let's move on. If we look at this system like uh, a circuit, uh, then we can do crown reduction, get rid of bus four. And we have three node system. For this three node system, we can build the current and the voltage relationship for the grid. This is the current and the voltage relationship for the grid. By the way, uh, generator three is, bus three is just the grid generator. And then um, decomposition, uh, metric decomposition. So that's, that's, that's a part of decomposition and change the current. So one current becomes the difference. The other current becomes the weighted sum. And then it's, uh, Decomposed, decomposed, uh, decoupled. And one is not related to VG, the other related to the grid uh, generator. Uh, so furthermore, if these two IBR have a similar, of course, then we can combine, get two different circuit, two individual circuit. And the individual circuit, the green one, of course, it's the difference between two IBRs. And it's the interaction of one IBR with XL. And XL is just this impedance in between but the, another IBR is IBR with XL plus two XLG. This is XLG is the grid strength, relate to grid strength. So with this circuit, then it uh, will explain why uh, inter IBR is uh, not influenced by grid strength, but uh, the weak grid will be influenced by the grid strength. Yeah, so that's the, uh, another application just also use matrix uh, decomposition. So I think I finished all the examples uh, to talk about the, uh, the, the, uh, the events or the oscillation analysis. 
So I will just make a couple of remarks on the IBR dynamic research, uh, mainly tools. So the first uh, comment is that the uh, EMT simulation is, is actually pretty good. It saves you great time to do the hardware because hardware is really time consuming. Uh, but it's good for control. As long as you don't do prototype control, I think EMT simulation is pretty good uh, to serve as a test bed. And there are lots of uh, developer model for you to use uh, by MATLAB and by PCGAT. Uh, however, analytical model building is indispensable eigenvalue analysis. These are so powerful tools uh, that can give you uh, better understanding insights. And in fact, I think I played with uh, Jose's uh, Julia a package that is analytical model building and they use something called Jacobian uh, linearizing to give you lots of eigenvalues. Uh, but on, uh, besides these two, in fact, we should look at the, uh, another powerful tool called a frequency domain analysis. And I think this is, has been less used by power system dynamics, but more by power electronics people. Uh, but I think this is, uh, there are much more to be explored and um, should keep working on that one. Uh, regarding the technology de development on the frequency, time, uh, frequency domain analysis, I put a couple of remarks. So in fact, you can look at the, even in 1970s, like John Andrew, they can do things very sophisticated. Like today, all these power electronic people, they can do like two subsystem load and the source, separate the system to two subsystem, and then use Nyquist to use body plot. Yeah, this, this is done in fact, back in 1970s, people have been able to do this. But there are some limitations. The first limitation is limited to two subsystem that you cannot scale up. Second is that my personal view is that Nyquist block, blah, 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 I cannot uh, like each time that requires so much like visual examination, it's quite difficult to look at in circumvent and difficult to get a full picture. I prefer eigenvalues and I prefer this can be scaled up. So in fact, in Semlin's 1999 paper, basically he says, yes, even you are using this admittance, you can scale up, build a bigger network, build a bigger matrix, just like a circuit analysis, and you can further calculate the uh, eigenvalues. Uh, yeah. However, between the 1970 to 99, this proposal, there's some necessity because 1970s people are actually talking about frequency response measurement, but 99 assembly is talking about using YS, S domain. So if you want to connect the measurement to the S domain, in fact, there's a critical technology called the frequency domain data fitting. The other ways cannot get, this requires lots of work from the system community, uh, system identification community, Lejeune, Pinterlands, and the invited professor assembling also himself develop a package called the vector fitting package and the free for use uh, posted online. And I think this book by Pinterlands was published in 2012. So in the last, I think, just a couple of years or maybe 10 or 20 years, frequency domain data fitting tool now becomes pretty mature. So these are the uh, kind of technology development make everything happen. I think uh, um, analysis algorithm methods, very mature, but now we have better powerful numerical tools for uh, from data to model. And I also think this approach is useful for IBR dynamic analysis. The reason is that IBR uh, control information is confidential. And OEM, OEM basically put a very strict requirement, no sharing, even some, some like maybe data, but internally basically see nothing as the black box model for grid operators. So therefore for grid operator, if they want to do a lots and lots of detailed wideband dynamic analysis, uh, I think the only way probably is to uh, identification the model from measurement data. And this can be used as validation as well as analysis. So that's, uh, I think, the current uh, things that uh, I'm working on as well. Uh, so with that, I think I finished my presentation. I will uh, let people ask questions and have a discussion. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Professor Fan.